Okay, the topic of this video is near and dear to any uh, measurement scientist's heart. It is the topic of propagation of an uncertainty. And in propagation of uncertainty, basically it's a mathematical computation to quantitatively describe the uncertainty in a computed result given the uncertainty in the measurement devices used to generate the data that yields the result. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what this is all about. Um, so of course, certain numbers are uh, considered exact. These are things that have been counted. For instance, seven days in a week, we might say, or 24 hours in a day. Um, constants are also um, generally considered exact unless uncertainty is, is given to you. Um, a good example of that might be um, atomic masses from the periodic table. Um, some periodic tables give you the uncertainty. There actually is uncertainty in those numbers, um, but we oftentimes treat them as constants otherwise. Um, nonetheless, all measured quantities are indeed subject to uncertainty. Um, and we can express this in a couple different ways. We, we can call this an absolute uncertainty, or we might choose to call it a relative uncertainty, and they're not the same. Um, an absolute uncertainty, what's going to be typical of that is a range of uh, values around the measured value, and that value is going to also carry the same unit as the measurement, and it specifies um, very precisely. Um, what the tolerance of the measurement device is, for instance, a burette might dispense fluid to plus or minus 0 0.02 milliliters. Well, that's an absolute uncertainty. On other occasions, you might encounter a measurement being given you, giving you a relative uncertainty or a percent relative uncertainty. In this case, the uncertainty of the, of the measurement is ratioed back to the value being dispensed or the value being measured. Um, so it's a relative measurement. We'll see more on that in a couple seconds here, okay? Um, but propagation of uncertainty is, is all about um, computing the uncertainty in a result um, given the limitations of measuring devices. And I'd rank this in a three out of four star. You have to be familiar with uh, these concepts. I think that is very important um, for your, your exams in analytical chemistry. Now before we dive into a sample problem to show how propagation of uncertainty works, I, I wanted to kind of just rehash this idea of um, tolerances of, of glassware and, and what that means basically for us. Um, because I do think that that in itself is kind of important. So um, what I've done here is I'm going to try to project, um, it's got a, a volumetric flask, a 50 milliliter volumetric flask. And what I wanted to do is, is take a few minutes and kind of zoom in um, so you can see what, what's written on the sides here, okay? Because I do believe that that is you know, a little bit important um, to this discussion, okay? So I'm trying to try to block the light as best I can here so you can really read it. I'll focus it a little bit better here. Um, now what you can see here, of course, this is a Pyrex Class A flask, 50 milliliters. And if you see right here by my thumb, it's written TC 20 degrees Celsius. The letters T and C. Now that, that stands for something. It's to contain. Volumetric flasks are used to make solutions. Of course, what we do is we, we put um, usually a solid in a flask and we, we fill it up to the calibration mark here on the neck. And when that bottom of the meniscus reaches that calibration mark, that flask contains the stated volume, okay? So it's to contain. Now if we pour that solution out into some other receiving vessel, do we transfer 50 mils? Probably not. It's probably going to be less. As some residual will be left behind in the flask, but if we use this correctly, it's going to contain 50 milliliters, okay? Note the temperature as well. The temperature is important because that's the calibration temperature. If you deviate far from that temperature, the glass can actually expand or contract, leading to erroneous volumes. Now another thing that I want you to see and notice, if you look over on this side, what you can see is plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters. 0 0.05 milliliters plus or minus. That is the tolerance of this flask. The tolerance. Essentially the precision with which we can expect this flask to function. So if you use it properly, dilute to the mark, you should expect that 50 plus or minus 0.05 milliliters is present 
inside this flask. Okay, the flask contains that. So those are some things I wanted to harp on. This is the tolerance. That's going to be important when we work our sample problem. All laboratory devices have a tolerance associated with it. For this flask, it's 0 0.05 milliliters. If I had a different flask, it might be a different value. If I had a pipette, it might be a different value. Balances, different values. Of course, that would be in grams. Notice here that this is given in milliliters. So this is our absolute tolerance or uncertainty. Okay? That'll be important in a couple minutes. We'll get back to that. But before we do, I wanted to show you one other device. Okay? This is a... Um, 25 milliliter volumetric pipette. You may have seen this before. It's the one that you have to put the bulb on the end to uh, measure volumes. And uh, here's a calibration mark. You can see it's 25 milliliters um, by the markings on the side. And if you look at the fine print, you can see it's 20 degrees Celsius again. That's again the uh, calibration temperature. Plus or minus 0 0.03 milliliters. That's its tolerance for this 25 milliliter pipette. Again, an absolute uncertainty. Notice that this one also reads a T, but it's not TC. If you look real closely, it is TD, TD, which stands for to deliver. Pipettes and burettes are always calibrated to deliver the stated volume. That means they're going to deliver the stated volume into some other separate receiving vessel. They're used to measure and meter and deliver that volume, not the other way around. Okay. Um, so that's typical of what you'd see on this type of, of device. Okay, so anything that delivers a volume is going to have a TD, most likely. Anything that um, is meant to contain, like a um, ball flask, a volumetric flask, or perhaps a uh, graduated cylinder, is going to contain. Notice that I've written that down on the bottom of the slide here. I did that so you remember that. I think that that's an important part of this discussion. Okay, so don't lose sight of those markings on the side of the volumetric wear. Um, and if you change the temperature, of course, the volumes can also change. You should never heat those devices too hot because you can actually warp the glass and that will destroy it. All right, so with that said, let's just kind of dive into this propagation of uncertainty thing. Now, the main idea here is that each step in a chemical analysis can potentially introduce error or uncertainty. When we use these measurement devices, they aren't perfect. They don't contain exactly 50 milliliters. They don't deliver exactly 25 milliliters. It's close. If we use them correctly and it's a quality of the device, but it's not perfect. They always have these tolerances. We would like to basically um, account for these tolerances. I almost hesitated to say add up these tolerances, but, but add up the effects of these tolerances in a mathematical way. It won't necessarily be direct sums. We'll see how we do that in a second. But we want to track this uncertainty through our calculations because if we divide a mass by a molecular weight to get moles and then we convert that into a concentration by divided by a volume, each of these mathematical steps we're going to perform to get our, our molarity but we also need our uncertainty. So there has to be a mathematical approach to keep track of that uncertainty so we know how exact our concentration is based on the devices that we used to make measurements. And that's what propagation of uncertainty is all about. It's going to be a mathematical process. We'll demonstrate that here in a sample problem in a second. If a calculation involves several steps, which it oftentimes does, you can propagate the error in the following order basically coincides with mathematical order of operations. Anything in parentheses, that goes first. Exponentation and logarithm steps goes next. Multiplication and division followed by addition and subtraction. That's kind of the order of importance, okay? Again, it's just mathematical order of operations. If you understand that, which hopefully you do, you can follow along. Just follow the same process, all right? So we're going to apply the rules that we're going to talk about on the next slide until the error is propagated through all of the calculation steps to the final error. This last point, also very important. Remember back in general chemistry, you learned all these rules for significant figures the first week. They didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it had to do with how many significant figures your numbers had or how many decimal significant figures your numbers had. Uh, and you had to kind of think it through and just learn the rules and apply them. Well, it turns out that if you can successfully propagate uncertainty through your calculation, 
you can use this different rule. And this one really makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, it's, it's a rational thing. What we want to do is stop reporting significant figures of our final calculated result in the same decimal place as where the experimental uncertainty begins. So you stop reporting digits in the same decimal place where uncertainty begins. That makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Okay. So if we're able to propagate the uncertainty through the calculation, we can actually go a long way to making sense of our, our chemical measurements um, in a, a very rational way. So to explain further, let's talk about rules. Now these rules are the mathematical statements that we will follow to propagate uncertainty in our computations. The first two rules on this list up here are highlighted in a different color. The purpose of that is those are the ones that we're going to use most often. Those are the ones that you should really focus on for your exam as far as I'm concerned. The remaining five rules might be used occasionally, but I include them here on the slide just for your benefit. Probably not used as often. Okay? But basically, you can see what dif differentiates these rules and these procedures over here on the right is the type of the calculation that you're performing. If you're performing a natural log, you would use this rule. If you're performing a base 10 log, you would use this rule. If you're doing addition or subtraction, you use the first. Okay? So each operation that you're performing has a different rule for propagation of the uncertainty. Let's key in on the first two up here. Because again, those two are the most common, right? And I want you to um, more or less focus in on these for your work in this class. What is the rule for addition and subtraction? Well, let's consider the case where you're going to add a couple numbers and then subtract one. So A, B, and C here are just the numbers, okay? Just some number that you have to add or subtract. If you want to propagate and it doesn't matter if this is a plus or a minus, by the way, okay? If you want to propagate the uncertainty through such a calculation where addition or subtraction is taking place, the rule to carry out is to square the absolute uncertainties of each of the numbers, add them together, take the square root. That gives us SY. SY is the absolute uncertainty in our answer Y, okay? So when we see these S terms here, 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 and here, those S terms are the absolute uncertainties or tolerances of Y for SY. SA is the absolute uncertainty for A, SB for B, and C for C, so on. So this rule is pretty simple. You just have to find the absolute uncertainties for each of the numbers, square them, add them together, take the square root, and that's your absolute uncertainty in Y. So if you're doing addition or subtraction, that's the rule you follow. What about multiplication or division? So you're going to have to multiply numbers and then maybe divide by something else. Okay? You encounter that type of calculation. What you need to do is follow this rule. Now what does this rule tell us? Okay? It's equally simple, although a little bit more complicated. Because now note that we don't just have these S, A, S, B, S, C terms. We have to divide them by A, B, and C. Well, A, B, and C are just the numbers themselves that are involved in the calculation. The S terms are still the absolute uncertainties or tolerances. So instead of adding the absolute uncertainties, here, what we're doing is we're taking the relative uncertainty in A, the relative uncertainty B, and relative uncertainty in C, we're squaring each, adding them together, and taking the square root. That re answer, that result, is not the absolute uncertainty in Y, but it's the relative uncertainty in Y. So the rules for multiplication or division as written deal with relative uncertainties. The rule for addition or subtraction as written it deals with absolute uncertainties. Usually when you report your result, You'll want to report it in terms of absolute uncertainty. I usually like to see that. I just like that it's in the same unit of measure as what you are uh, discussing. 
Um, that gives me some comfort to understand uh, how big that uncertainty is relative to the number that you're talking about. Okay? So nonetheless, these are the rules that we need to follow. The other mathematical operations have their own rules, as we can see down below. So what I'd like to do now is just to dive into a sample problem that shows an application of this. Okay? And what this um, sample problem asks us is it says a student dissolves 11.6324 grams of a compound into the 50 milliliter volumetric flask we considered earlier to prepare a solution. If the balance the student used had a tolerance of plus or minus 0 0.0003 grams, express the concentration of the compound in grams per milliliter and the associated uncertainty. All right, so wrap your mind around that for a second here. And then let's begin. So where do we start with this? Well, I always try to identify the numbers that are involved, okay? So, so one thing I came up with here is very quickly, my mind decided that this number was important. That's the mass of the substance that the student used, okay? Now, do I know the uncertainty for that measurement? That was the mass measurement. Well, he used this balance that had this tolerance. So I'm going to use that as my uncertainty. Notice I made it a range around that number. And there's a second number. There is a 50 milliliter volumetric flask. And I mentioned that that volumetric flask is the one that we considered earlier. So if I sort of bring that back into the field of view here and zoom in a little bit more here, maybe we can see what that uncertainty is. If I look very closely, it's written right here. Looks like it's plus or minus 0.05. So when I use that flask, that's my uncertainty or my tolerance. So now I have two values, and I can use these in conjunction with one another. And the result of a calculation will be a division to figure out the concentration of the substance in grams per milliliter. Of course, that's not easy or not too terribly difficult to do, right? I want the concentrations in grams per milliliter. All I need to do is take my grams, divide by milliliters. So 11.6324 divided by 50. And that gives me an answer. And it looks like that answer is, um, and I'm going to keep a bunch of sig figs right here. This will not be ultimately correct. Um, but I'm just going to keep reporting all the digits that I get. When I did that, I got 0.232648 grams per milliliter after doing that division, okay? So that tells me my approximate concentration, but unfortunately, right now, I know absolutely nothing about the uncertainty. I need to propagate my uncertainty through the computation, or else I'm in big trouble, and I don't know how precise it is. I don't know how many digits I should report it to. So we have to propagate. Now how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is, is this an addition or subtraction or multiplication division? Of course, it is a division, okay? So consequently, I need to use the rule that we talked about on that previous slide for division. Which is the same as multiplication, okay? Now, what did that rule tell us to do? Does anybody remember? Hopefully you do. What the rule told us to do is add the squares of the relative uncertainty to the number used to generate our quantitative result. It looks to me that my relative uncertainty in my flask is this. This is my tolerance divided by the volume that I'm going to use. That's my relative uncertainty. Over here, I need to write a term for my balance. 
Well, the measurement was 11.6324 grams. And all these are units that are consistent with one another, so this would be milliliters that cancel out. This would be grams here and here, and that would cancel out. But my tolerance, you might remember, was 0003 grams. So the units cancel, they go away at this point in the calculation. Okay, so hopefully you study that for a second. If I look back to, this is the tricky part, I guess, right? If I look back to the formula, remember it looked like this. There were three terms in this particular formula um, way back when. Okay, but now there's only two because there's two measurements. This is for a case where you had to add or, or um, sorry, multiply or divide three numbers. Here we only have two, so we only need two terms. But again, you saw the uncertainty divided by the number. Uncertainty divided by the number squared, okay? And that's the relative uncertainty of the results. So my answer, once I compute this, is going to be the relative uncertainty in y. And of course, y is that number. The answer that I want to get, okay? So I got to do a little bit of math work. And when I do that, I am in business, okay? I'm going to be in business. All right, so if I end up taking, if I end up by squaring this, adding it to this, okay, and taking the square root of that sum, I get this for sy over y, okay? That's what I get for sy over y. Now, another thing I want to uh, um, sort of point out while we're discussing this, okay? If I just do this division and don't square it, I'm just doing the division, okay? I get 0 0.001. If I just do this without squaring it, and I do the division, the result of that is 2.5 seven nine times ten to the minus five. Okay, scientific notation there. Okay? Now if I do all the math and square root, I, I get this. And that's my SY over Y. We'll come back to that in a second, okay? But before I do, I wanted to point something out to you. When you're working in lab, it's very, very, very common that one step in your procedure dominates your overall uncertainty. Okay? Looks like we add it together here under the square root bracket, and we, we do mathematically, okay? But look at our answer for our relative uncertainty in y. Isn't that just a little bit higher than what we had for our relative uncertainty for this step? If you look back what that was, that was the use of the volumetric flask, okay? This is very, very, very common. What I'm basically saying here is the uncertainty of one step or one device is oftentimes limiting. And if you can study your uncertainty, perform an analysis of your uncertainty, you can oftentimes identify which step it is that's responsible for the large amount of uncertainty in your result. And if you can improve that step by using a different device or a higher quality device, you may be able to reduce overall uncertainty. So in this case, the use of the volumetric flask with this relative uncertainty it's far greater than the relative uncertainty for the analytical balance that we use because the balance has very, very good precision. Okay, so the flask is what's really hurting us and limiting us. That's very, very common. Right? So when you're actually looking into uncertainties um, in your lab or even in problems, see if you can identify you know, which step um, is really limiting and maybe you can improve upon it. But nonetheless, we do the math we find that SY over Y is equal to this number. Now what is that? That is the relative uncertainty. The relative uncertainty in our result. What does that mean? Well, for one, it's not the absolute uncertainty. And usually when I report my concentration, I want to report this number plus my absolute uncertainty. Now remember what this number was over here? That was the result of the mass divided by the volume. This is our concentration. Okay, our concentration is very, very close to that. So 
I'm going to write that again over here. So 0 0.2, 3, 2, 6, 4, 8, plus or minus something gram per milliliter. So the question is, is, is what do we write here? What is the something that is going to bound this concentration in terms of its uncertainty? Well, it's not this number, because what I want to write here is going to be my absolute uncertainty. This is my relative, so I need to convert. But that's not hard, because I know that SY divided by Y is equal to this. Y, remember, is the result of my calculation. So if I want to, I can plug in 0.232648 directly here for Y and set that equal to this number. And then after I do that, I can certainly multiply this by this to solve directly for SY. And if I solve for SY, I find that it's equal to 0, 0, 0, 2, 3, 2, 7, 2, 5. Again, I'm including all sig figs at this point that I'm returning on my uh, calculator um, just for the interest of our discussion. Okay, It's not necessarily correct. I'm just being comprehensive right now. But that is my absolute uncertainty, SY, in my result. So this number could go here now. Okay? Hopefully you're following around and you see that. Now, remember earlier I gave you a very, very important rule involving significant figures. It was this last one. The last significant figure of the final result must, or the least significant figure of the final result, must be in the same decimal place as the first sig fig of the uncertainty. So, in what place does our uncertainty begin? Moving to decimal place 1, 2, 3, 4 is where I start to see that uncertainty begin. It's zero before that. There's no uncertainty in those digits. Okay? But in that fourth decimal digit, that's where our uncertainty begins. So if I look over here, I have one, two, three, four, or that six is, that's where my uncertainty begins. Everybody see that? So I'm going to ditch these other digits because they're uncertain. I don't know that those are true because my uncertainty tells me that they may or may not be. Right. So now, I'm getting closer to my answer. I can write this with four decimal digits in accordance with my uncertainty estimate. Notice that I rounded down to the six there. That was a four, I believe. I rounded down. Just did that automatically without thinking. And also notice that here I wrote 0 .0002. I rounded down as well. Now notice here I had like uh, six different digits here to the right of the decimal place that are considered significant. But, but here, I truncated that to only one. Now why did I do that? Well, doesn't it make sense that if my uncertainty begins in this decimal place, that all of these other numbers are, are also probably kind of uncertain? I think that makes a lot of sense. So typically, we only report uncertainties to one sig fig. And that's what I've done here. I just rounded to this 2. And that's where I would stop. So then my answer would be 0.2326 plus or minus 0 0.0002 gram per milliliter. And that would be my concentration plus or minus my uncertainty. Stop reporting digits in my number which we called Y here, okay, in our mathematics. Stop reporting digits once the uncertainty begins. Only report one sig fig for your uncertainty. All right, so that gives you an example problem involving multiplication and division for propagation of experimental uncertainty. I hope this tutorial has been useful for you. It's something that I think is a uh, pretty interesting uh, concept. 
certainly very useful for the experimental scientist. We'll see you next time.